and just appreciate uh, Tina and Jessa so much. I, I learned I learned a, a lot. I tagged all the resources. I want to bring them into the classroom with the students and the teachers that I work with. Um, we're going to be transitioning now. Uh, so so you can see um, a lot of the affirmations in the chat. Uh, we're going to be transitioning uh, to our, our next speaker now. Um, our next speaker is uh, Cynthia. Uh, you know, I went right there. Uh, uh, I'm a mute brother, Elias. <laughs> um, our next speaker is uh, Cynthia uh, Guardado, uh, who's going to be uh, talking to us about radical teaching, looking beyond our identity to serve um, Black, Indigenous, people of color, and queer, trans, people of color communities. Um, Cynthia is a Los Angeles-born Salvadoran poet and tenured professor of English at Fullerton College. She is the author of two collections of poetry, uh, Sanisas and Endeavor. Her poems have appeared in Poetry Magazine, U.S. Latinx Voices in Poetry, and The Wondering Song. Cynthia won the Concurso by uh, Nacional de Poesia, uh, Belisiera Frost in 2017, and Sanisas was a finalist for the National Poetry Series in 2019. So I can't wait to, to hear from you, Cynthia. Welcome. If we can uh, welcome her in the chat, y'all. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, just had to do that mic check. Uh, so um, I'm really happy to be here. Um, and I have a PowerPoint that I'm going to go through. I probably prepared too much. I did time myself. So I may skip some slides, but, but everything is already in my folder um, in the Google Drive. Uh, so you'll be able to access it everything later. Um, I'm going to go ahead and I think I can share a screen. Am I sharing screen? Oh, yeah, I see it. Okay. All right, so um, this is my Google folder. I just want to go over it really quick. These right here are resources. Of, um, this is my talk, but these two here are resources that, that you could use or recirculate on your campus with faculty or with other educators. Um, this one goes over really like it's like a four slides explaining equity versus equality. And this is also by US, both of them are were created by USC's Race and Equity Center. Um, so these are both things that you can um, use this one just came out the race conscious implementation that one's brand new i think they circulated that maybe two weeks ago uh, so i just wanted to point that out i have links and resources um, so it looks like this and i did like titles articles websites and links for you to look at um, and then um, I added some readings that I assign and then some classroom materials. So some assignment sheets, um, these are just there for examples um, for you to see what I'm doing in my classroom. Um, and I did some that were related to what I'll be talking about today. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and start. Let me just refresh this and get to the front of this slideshow. Uh, so this is just for context, a photo of Yellowstone, um, the river that runs through Yellowstone, and it's just such a beautiful place. So I just added it. My contact information is in the slide. I did my personal email instead of my work email. And then um, my Instagram is a really good way to get a hold of me as well, um, just because, you know, things sometimes get lost in email. Um, and it's also more of a personal platform versus right um, work related in any capacity. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, the title is Radical Teaching, um, Looking Beyond Ourselves to Serve by POC and CutiePot Communities. Um, so this was the summary. I'm not sure if you all read it, um, but I'll go ahead and just read it. Radical teaching requires us to serve our diverse student population with love and understanding. In order to do this, we need to decolonize our minds by dismissing cisgender, white supremacist, heteronormative, and classist academic norms 
that are an injustice to our students. This talk will focus on applying the above to our grading practices and classroom activities. Additionally, it will pre briefly address how we can engage in dismantling white supremacy and other systems of oppression outside of the classroom. The goal is to show that although our primary focus is the classroom, our work against racial injustice requires a holistic approach. Um, I just wanted to define these um, really quick. Um, by POC is Black Indigenous People of Color. QDPOC is an acronym for Queer and Trans People of Color. And queer, in this case, is used as a synonym for LGBTQIA2S+, which is lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and are questioning intersex, asexual, two-spirit, and the countless affirmative ways in which people choose to self-identify. Um, and I'll be talking a lot about equity and intersectionality. So I put up the these brief definitions for each. Uh, so equity is about fairness. It ensures that each person gets what they need to achieve their education and career goals. It is not the same as equality. It requires us to look at intersectionality. Intersectionality is the acknowledgement that everyone has their own unique experiences of discrimination and oppression. And we must consider everything and anything that can marginalize people, gender, race, class, sexual orientation, physical ability, et cetera. So I'm going to start with some fallacies. So a fallacy is a mistaken belief, especially one based on unsound argument. Um, and these are things that I just commonly hear around campus um, and from other educators. So I wanted to start with these three to sort of set the tone. So number one is our campus is diverse. Uh, so diversity without racial justice by POC and QD Pop representation among faculty and staff um, and equity is not true diversity. Um, I think that um, we hear this so often of uh, people referring to diversity already being present, but is it present in all the levels of hierarchy that we have on our campus? Um, so just really, you know, kind of making sure that when we hear these things, right, um, we are thinking, wait, that's wrong, right? Because as we can look at most of our institutions, um, they are not diverse in all levels and all branches. Um, sometimes our student populations are, um, but not our, our entire structure. Um, this really made me think about that. This is uh, uh, Jay, the, the handles right there on the bottom. I follow um, um, this uh, cutie pop person online um, and they posted this and I thought that this was really important Important. So I just kind of wanted to also share it to set the tone for today. Um, having an implicit bias training after you've already worked hard to hire and retain racist people won't change anything in your organization except your gaslighting techniques. Um, I saw this a while ago and I pinned it on my Instagram and it really made me think about my own campus. Um, I work in uh, North Orange County. Um, my district is in incredibly um, racist and not moving forward in many of the directions that we need to move in. Um, and But yet we have a lot of these trainings that occur and guest speakers who come, um, but it, everything seems to be these, these in um, one-off activities, right? That are not really pushing us in the direction that we need to be going. Um, so I just wanted to share this with you because I really appreciated this when it was shared. Um, fallacy number two is everything we do is already about equity. So I really wanted to include this because equity has been the hot term um, for about a decade now and really hot term right over the past five years or so. Um, but the issue is that equity is used by faculty, staff and managers in meetings, committees, equity plans for campuses and mission statements but is rarely understood or put into practice. So discussions about equity often intentionally avoid race, racism, and intersectionality. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the things that I try to do um, is I try to make sure that um, I am in any committee where I am a part of, in any meeting that I'm a part of, um, and the word equity is being used, and I can tell that equity is being used incorrectly, I try to redefine it for the room or the slide that I uh, provided um, in the Google folder. I use that slide and I circulate it, right? That 
slide, that four slide piece on explaining equity to folks, because I think it's really important to ground people in the definition of it um, before um, we can continue talking about it. Um, so this right here is one of that a piece of that whole slide. I'm not going to read the whole thing, just the second paragraph, which I think is important. Um, so equity mindedness is social and historical exclusion occur not only based on race, but also on class, sexual orientation, gender, disability, age, religion, and creed. The social and historical awareness of exclusionary practices requires an understanding of intersectionality, a recognition that class, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, age, religion, creed, disability, and gender do not exist separately from each other, but are woven together to create unique experiences. Um, I kind of think like even this unique experiences part here is problematic in this because really what they're woven together in a society that systemically oppresses people um, and so therefore it's a unique form of oppression that people with these intersections with intersections right of oppression are experiencing so it's just something to keep in mind this is part of that fourth slide that's in the um in the google folder um and this is the last fallacy here. I can only make change in my classroom. Um, so we have the power to encourage and inspire students in the classroom, but we also need to dismantle systems of oppression and injustice by taking our efforts out of the classroom and making change across institutions and communities. I'm going to come back to this at the end after I finish the presentation, but I think that um, I mean, I can relate with this. I've felt this way, like said this probably, I can only make change in my classroom. Um, and that often happens when I'm experiencing burnout or I'm really getting disillus disillusioned about making change. Um, so I'm definitely guilty of saying this one here. Um, and then I have to remind myself that I'm able to make change in many different aspects of my life, my community and my campus. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure we have that up here. Um, so this is a question um, that um, Luchan Santiago asked us, and so I wanted to put this here in bullet points. Um, the bold one is really the one I'm going to focus on today because clearly I don't have time to cover how I do all of these things. But I, I address issues of race, racism, and injustice in classroom content and ped pedagogy, supporting and engaging students, committee work, community work, and creative work. Uh, so I'm my entire life is sort of revolving around this all the time. And I'm doing it in all of these spaces because it, all of these spaces offer me the ability to be able to bring um, discussion about race, racism, and injustice to a variety of different groups of people. Um, and that's why I'm always doing it in all of these spaces. So this is a main focus that I, um, for the first part of my presentation that I wanted to focus on, which is equitable grading practices. Um, there's a book recommendation here. It's also on the list and I linked it. Um, so grading for equity, what it is, why it matters and how it can transform schools and classrooms by Joe Feldman. Uh, if you're already using equitable grading practices, this book will be reassuring, but there are also a lot of great and new suggestions in this book as I felt with um, each time I go to back to the book. Uh, so I wanted to talk about my moment of self-realization. Um, so obviously I showed you right my five bullets of all the ways that I've constantly working um, um, around um, dealing with issues of systemic and institutional oppression, um, yet I was perpetuating those same systems of oppression. So I'm just gonna go ahead and read this. Uh, so my moment of self-realization, in my second year as a full-time professor in English, I participated in a grade norming session with my department and was surprised to find out that I was grading essays significantly harder than my mostly white department. 
This prompted me to reflect on my grading practices and question why I had them. Eventually, I realized that I was regurgitating the same harsh grading practices I had experienced as an undergraduate student at UCSD, which I found harsh and inflexible as a student. So why was I doing this as a professor? Um, I'm going to stop sharing just for this part because I feel like this is really important. <laughs> um, I really sat with that question for quite some time, asking myself, why am I doing this, right? Uh, why am I, literally, I had like a pretty terrible experience um, in my first writing class, right? The, um, the one that qualified for graduation at UC Santa Cruz. Um, I had been arrested in Los Angeles, uh, yet I was going to UC Santa Cruz. And so I had court dates in LA and I had like my court paperwork and everything. And so my teacher had like a really inflexible three uh, absence policy, right? And I showed him my court paperwork. I was doing fine in the class, but then, right, he um, made me drop the class over the absences, despite him being aware of my situation, which was unique. Um, but then, um, even the way that I was graded, right, like the markups on my essays, how everything was approached, I then was regurgitating that in my classroom. And one of the things that I really thought about is how little time as educators, we are taught how to grade. <laughs> We are taught how to do that in our classroom, right? Um, we're often handed like these pedagogical articles um, and that is like what we're expected to do. We're just thrown into the classroom during our semesters of teaching um, and we're supposed to learn. And so obviously what we're doing is we're taking how we've been graded our own experiences and applying them into the classroom. Um, and so I really spent a lot of time thinking about this um, and started to make changes changes in my classroom um, and the pandemic as well, moving into the online classroom really pushed me in making these changes and becoming even more flexible, right? Uh, so I'm gonna sort of go through those now. So let me share again. Okay, so these are my pillars that I felt were most important for sharing today for equitable grading. So no zeros, only 50%. So I don't give any zeros in my class. Um, one of the most common arguments that I hear, even from um, faculty or other coworkers who are doing a lot of equitable practices, when I tell them about this policy in particular, is why would I award points for work students didn't do, is sort of the argument that I hear. Um, and you're not awarding any points, <laughs> right? Why is zero the grading floor when a 50% is already an F minus? No one gives a G, an H, an I, et cetera, right? So there really is no need for a zero to exist. Eliminating zeros allows students' grades to recover quickly and livens the penalty for missed work. When I made this change, I saw drastic results in my classroom and students want to turn in late work and students want to um, uh, continue in the course even after they had missed work. Um, one of the things um, in my summary, it said like uh, sort of dissecting and unpacking and moving, dismantling these academic norms. An academic norm is that you give a zero when something is missing, but who set those norms, right? Academia has always been elitist and classist and racist in the United States and in many nations around the world. So we have to sort of start to question why are we contributing to these practices or why are we still doing them even with all the knowledge that we have? So this is a super simple, easy change you can make to your classroom that will drastically impact students. Because for example, no matter how much I would, I tell students prior to doing this, that if they stay to the end of the course, if they just stayed, that they would pass. When they saw how their uh, grade had plummeted, even in the first like four weeks of school from missing homework, they would get discouraged and drop the course and not continue. But they don't see that same plummet in their grade if you're not giving zeros. Uh, so this is just a really 
quick and easy change you can make to your course. Um, even now, this week, before you start teaching, if you haven't already started. Um, so the second one here is reward improvement with grade replacements. Make earlier assignments worth less of the course grade and make later assignments worth more. Additionally, use the last major assignment grade to replace a grade on an earlier assignment. Since I teach English, the example that I can give you is my course has five essays. The research essay is really the essay that um, shows like how much they have learned throughout the semester. So I take the grade, not only is that one worth 20% of their grade, um, but then I take whatever grade they earn on that one and I replace their, their lowest out of class essay grade. So it becomes a huge bump. Since I've done that, I think almost all my classes, the grade is usually A and B. Um, and then there, of course, are some C's, some D's, some F's, but um, the highest grades, grades being assigned, usually the percentage is always A's and B's are being assigned in my class ever since I did the no zeros and the grade replacement. Um, I know that it can be challenging to accept late work. Um, and so the way that I've sort of approached it is I have set late work for an entire unit. So for working on an essay, of course, I want them to do all the prep work for that essay because I want them to be successful on that essay. So I allow them to turn in all the late work for that essay up until that essay's due date. Um, and so if they're missing anything and then they do want to turn in the late work and I'm doing my outreach, I can encourage them to earn their points for the homework while also I'm encouraging them to be prepared to write the essay. So these are my three pillars for equitable grading that are really easy to do, um, changes that are easy to make to your syllabi and your course um, quickly. There are things that are much more intensive, um, but these are ones that are quick and easy to do that really make a dramatic change for students. Um, and this is just a quote um, from Joe Feldman from his book that I think is just a, a really important question for us to focus on as educators. What do my grading practices say about who I am and what I believe? Uh, so this is really important. Um, one question, one thing that um, I would say between that question and this last pillar here about accepting late work is oftentimes one thing that I also learned as I kept reflecting on my grading practices and my syllabi um, was my syllabus was incredibly inflexible before, yet I was very flexible. If a student said that they needed to turn something in late or a student came to class and they didn't have their work, I would encourage them to give it to me later, the next class meeting when they had it. But my syllabus was actually incredibly strict. And so then I had to ask myself, why does my syllabus not match my practices? Um, and so that's something else that we can do to sort of make everything a lot more welcoming for students when they walk into our classroom is if we actually have flexible practices, our syllabus should reflect that. Um, I'm not going to read every single one of these because I'm going to run out of time. Um, but my pillars for course content are um, these three here, I contextualize systemic oppression for students with a unit about black oppression. Um, since they are studying here in the United States, I think um, talking about black oppression is really important to contextualize white supremacy in this country and how laws codify white supremacy in the United States. Um, but then I think it's also really important because in Southern California, right, we are um, Latinx, um, you know, Mesoamerican heavy in our classroom. And so I also think that it's important to open up conversations about anti-Blackness and colorism in various communities. So I always, always do a unit um, on Black oppression in my classroom. Uh, create space for students to center their own experiences in the classroom. You can do this in a variety of ways, through activities, through assignments, but this is very, very important. Uh, incorporate a major assignment where students are able to pick their research topics. So Although my research paper, I did um, include uh, the assignment sheet for it in the resources, is quite challenging. They get to pick what systemic oppression they want to focus on. Oftentimes, students do center their own identity, things that they have witnessed, or things they became interested in along the course. Um, this right here um, is the pyramid of student success for men of color in community colleges. It's from the 
the book, Teaching Men of Color, which is also on the list. Um, student Success, Effective and Engaging Pedagogy and Relational Trust, Mutual Respect and Authentic Care. Um, and this is really important. Um, if students can't trust us, then we can't effectively do the other two things um, in the pyramid. Uh, so I'm going to transition now to talking about two activities that I really love. I'm going to contextualize them and go through them as quickly as possible. Um, so the post-it silent anonymous activity is one of my favorite in class face-to-face -face activities. Um, the total time is about 20 minutes. I really truly miss this one and I'm happy to um, be returning in the fall and be able to do this activity in person with my students. So usually I do this activity after we have covered some heavy content. So I schedule this activity after we have learned about um, police violence, police shootings, hate crimes, border deaths, or are discussing topics that are difficult to digest and uncomfortable, white supremacy, toxic masculinity, ableism. Um, and so what I do is I I usually start class with the free write, um, but in this free write, um, I ask them to reflect on the topic. So maybe we were discussing the content before, maybe I showed a video, maybe there was a reading, maybe I asked them to research something. Um, and since I teach citizen black Claudia Rankin, it does reference a lot of police shootings. So oftentimes I'll ask them to look into what happened, but not watch the videos. Um, and, and then, so after five minutes, I, I start walking around while they're doing this and I drop post-its on all their desks. Um, and after five minutes, I instruct them to share something they are feeling anonymously on the post-it. Um, then I designate a table for them to put them on. And I try to make myself look as busy as possible so they don't look uh, feel like I'm watching who's putting post-its where. Um, and then I still, I go, after everyone's done, I go over to where the uh, post-its are and I select three to five post-its to share with the entire class and prompt discussion. Um, I use this as an opportunity to highlight understanding, discomfort, and encourage engagement in discussion. Um, usually the post-its will reveal right a student that is questioning the topic, questioning the validity of the these critical race theory arguments, or students who are really processing internally, reflecting, having heavy feelings about what's occurring, something that they wouldn't necessarily share, raising their hand in the classroom, um, or even if they were paired up with a single other person. Uh, so that's why I like to do this post-it activity when um, we cover something pretty heavy um, and um, or we're transitioning to a topic that is just pushing the envelope for them at that point in the course. Um, so a note, um, I just usually keep po the post-its and I would display the, my favorites um, on the wall in my office. Um, and they are often very powerful. And when students come into my office, um, they're usually, if they're waiting for me to do something or they're sitting in there waiting for me, um, they're like reading the post-its at the wall and it becomes like a topic of conversation about what's the content that's there. Um, Let's see. And so this one um, is uh, knowledge building through a collaborative research activity. Um, I'm gonna not read through all this, but the way I'll explain it is that um, on Canvas, they have an annotation tool. And uh, what I've done is I just put the assignment up for everyone and then I assign specific sections to pairs and they get in pairs and I instruct them to basically it's usually a pretty challenging text to go in and just like Google everything, like do quick Googles, try to find out as much as you can, um, instructing them to look for references, to find terms. And also, um, uh, if it, if it's a, a text that may have metaphors or similes to try to figure out what those are. And then after I select some groups to do mini presentations on what they found. And really, I started doing this um, only last semester. And the results were really remarkable because I could see the students feeling empowered to tackle these super difficult texts that they very much were like hesitant with initially when I introduced them to the text. And so through this really quick activity, they feel empowered in not a knowledge building, but then also 
the subtext is they get to leave with these skills and kind of go home and be able to do this when they're ever encountering something that's challenging for them. And so I just really love this activity and I would highly recommend that you do it. It can be adapted to uh, face-to-face. Um, I'm not exactly sh- sure how it could work in an asynchronous class, but um, this is definitely something that could be adapted to face-to-face and a Zoom hybrid course. Uh, so I got through that kind of quick. So this is um, my book here, um, and I'm not going to read the 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 whole summary here, but I just wanted to share it with you. My book is coming out this fall. Um, and this is part of like my community where creative work. Um, my parents are Salvadorian born. I'm second generation in the United States. Um, and I am writing their history um, through their stories um, and also my own research and my own experiences tackling this argument, a diaspora and all of those uh, people who are living outside of their homelands. Um, this text is really important in terms of what it, how I'm honoring my family. And I really resonated with what Jessa said earlier about let us tell our stories. Um, one thing that is very common in, um, uh, you will find in um Uh, librerias, bookstores in El Salvador, is that many texts that are written about Salvadorian history are written by people who are not Salvadorian. Um, And so there's just a lot of stuff that's going on um, where folks are not right able to write their own histories which is why it's so crucial that we do write our stories that we tell the stories of our people um, because otherwise um, other folks come in and try to tell our stories right um, and so just one context for the book is the second poem in it which is really the opening poem to say context is called the historian and it's about the conversation I have with my mother to try to learn as much as I can about my heritage. Um, So I wanted to end with this. Uh, Since we can all agree we truly value supporting marginalized students, we have to take our radical justice center practices outside of the classroom and into our campus and communities. Everything I did in this presentation was really more about the classroom. Um, And really, I think that as educators, if we're here, we know how important our work is in the classroom. And this goes back to this sort of, oh, the only change I can make is in the classroom. If we know that the change that we can make is in the classroom and the cha- and, and we're focused on making um, that change and supporting students, we also know that other educators need to be doing that too, which is why it's important to take it out of the classroom, take it in our t- into our committees um, and try to find ways to get all educators on a more um, on the same plane about equitable practices for our students. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing. Okay, so that is everything that I have, I think. Ha, 1.30. Wow, I timed that well. <laughs> Beautiful, wonderful job. Um, let's give mm-hmm. some uh, affirmations in the chat box, emojis. Um, the, the chat box was popping off, Cynthia, while you were presenting with some wonderful <laughs> affirmations for your work. I'll have to look at it later. <laughs> One of the things that, that I uh, really appreciate is um, is the, the duality of, that you were talking to us, right? The transformative change is possible in our own classrooms through that critical self-reflection. And our, like something we may not spend a lot of time things, thinking about, but our grading policies, the way that we support students, the way that we help them to access uh, what we're teaching, how we're teaching, uh, and to be able to give them the opportunity to show and demonstrate their learning in multiple and different ways. So I really appreciate that. That's something that is making me think, um, you know, as, as a K-12 educator, right? Like, how do you use grades as a, as a part of a motivator, but really, like, how are we approaching the students in a way that is respecting their humanity um, mm-hmm. and also helping them to heal from how school has traumatized them uh, while also motivating them to engage in rigorous 
like reading and writing like you showed us. And then finally, the last piece that I just really resonated with is um, when things are working, share it, you know, get other people, build a squad um, and start to really change the structures of our institution. So thank you so much for that. Um, thank you. We're now open to those comments, questions, feedback, ideas. You can put them in the chat box. You can use the uh, Q and A feature, um, and you can also unmute yourself and uh, and talk to Cynthia. So in in the chat box, there's just like a lot of affirmations, inspired, informed, excellent work. People thanking you for your resources. Alfie says, thank you for reminding us to reflect on our practices and check ourselves, not to uphold systems of oppression in our own practice word. <laughs> it looks like Alejandro uh, Vial Bando has his, their hand raised. Yeah, thank you so much for what you shared. I, um, I was... Um, I really appreciate those things and they resonated a lot when you talked about doing the reflection on your syllabus and I think a lot of us fall into those traps, right, of reproducing a lot of the things that that we've experienced, sometimes even unbeknownst to us. Um, and But I know that, right, like I, I know I noticed in your bio, right, like you have a full time job now, you're at one place. And I'm curious, like, what would you say to the adjunct faculty that's moving from campus to campus on how to, like, be more mindful of those things um, while still maintaining kind of streamlined, you know, like uh, grading practices? Um, you know what I'm saying? Because, like, and, and I'll just share, like, the context that I'm thinking of, right? Like, there was times when I was, before I got on the tenure track, that I was on uh, four campuses working at the same time with about 400 to 500 students under my uh my um como se dice? like under my um whatever like uh in my docket right and so it was very difficult to not do very like traditional kind of basic whack you know assessments you know what i mean because i was literally driving all throughout southern california you know like from riverside to irvine to la to anywhere and everywhere in between so you know that with that in that context i'm sure there's folks here or could watch in the future that maybe maybe find your reflections useful thank you so much again for what you provided thank you um so one thing i will say that I think is the biggest difference between being an adjunct and being a full-time on a campus with, uh, my department is huge, it's 43 full-time faculty. Um, and so we could be our own division, that's how big we are. Um, but it is mostly white uh, still, right? I think there's seven of us who are uh, cutie pop um, um, or by POC. But... Um, there is a core group there of folks who are extremely interested in equitable grading and um, changing classroom practices. And it only takes a handful of people, which is fantastic to sort of like make change. And I would say that the biggest difference for me from an adjunct to a full time um, is that I did not have access to this knowledge whatsoever right being an adjunct you're like like this prep that prep this campus that campus right um you don't have time for the meetings or the professional development or any of that right and i would say that that actually is the biggest difference um that i didn't have access to the knowledge which is why it's so important to me to share it as much as possible wherever i can um even when i just like randomly meet another person who's a professor or an educator somewhere right um my my no zeros thing is like all the time in conversation now right um but these practices, um, if you do pick up Joe Feldman's book, um, Grading for Equity, they actually streamline grading. <laughs> Um, because you're not giving zeros, right? Um, so it's 50%. You're flexible on late work. Um, so you're not as stressed about what the, for example, how it's impacting a student's grade because you're being flexible on the student um, grade. And one other thing that I didn't cover because I felt like it was going to get like too complicated is 
Um, I recently, last semester, so one of the things that I was thinking about and I wanted to say is that one of these academic norms that we regurgitate is the fear factor is using fear with points, using fear with high stakes to get students to do work. That actually makes a lot of students shut down, right? It's not really an effective practice yet. It is a practice that has been used for a long time. So I used to do that with making like high stakes assignments with a lot of points even though they were still in their weighted categories. So it was just really to cause fear on like specific homework assignments, right? Like to be like, do this one because it's worth a lot. Last semester, I made everything except for the major assignments, which are usually three to five, depending on the course, worth one point. Everything was even. And so this also, I felt like was remove the pressure of students feeling like, um, if they did this one assignment, they were going to lose a lot of points. And if they didn't do this assignment, they were going to, it was going to hurt their grade drastically. Everything was even. And so then it was like on a day where you just don't have the time to do your homework for whatever, you know, capacity is going, like what's going on in your life. You're only losing 50% of one point within a weighted category, right? Um, and so I actually think that a lot of these practices streamline grading. So for adjuncts, it actually could make things a lot easier, right? When you have a grade replacement, uh, when you're making everything worth one point, when you don't give zeros and you're flexible on the late work. Um, and I think for everyone, late work, those kinds of things, it does get complicated, right? Um, and my rule, especially since I use Canvas, um, is just like, if you're turning in something late, you've got to put it on campus. It all needs to be there so that I know where to find it and can grade it, right? And what I do is I grade homework in at the end of the unit, and they know that. So they're not a seeing the 50% appear because that gives them anxiety, right? And so I just grade everything at the end of the unit. If it's not there at the end of the unit, then I grade all that homework in bulk at once. And that actually streamlined grading for me because I would be really bad on staying on top of grading homework. And now it makes it so I'm grading it in that, in that uh, bulk way. Um, there's another hand. Elias, you want to ask your question, brother? Oh, can you hear me? We can hear you. What's Good. up? Uh, thanks. No, th uh, thank you, Dr. Guardado. That was um, mm. awesome. That was a great presentation and so well delivered. Uh, I was especially impressed. I want to commend you and also just follow up on the post-its uh, discussion, the way you, you bring in, you know, kind of like the deeper reflections, um, uh, deeper thoughts in such an innovative way. You know, it, it also reminds me because um, I'm teaching ethnic studies at Santa Monica College, and I've, I've been a long time teacher of Chicano studies, ethnic studies, and also study rhetoric. And you just remind me how, you know, even the post-its are, can be, I think Sylvia might have mentioned something in the chat to the effect of um, that, that it's it, it itself of, of, you know, a source, a primary source of information or students reactions to knowledge mm -hmm. also reminds me of like Ronald Takaki's emphasis in a different mirror um, asking like how do we know what we know and that you know um, things are understood through bodies right like uh, racialized gendered queer bodies uh, a bodily understanding of things and um, I'm just curious if you have anything more to say about like how how those uh, that post-it exercise contributes to learning in the classroom. Um, one thing I will add is when I decided to start the post-it activity uh, was also because I I I kept having um, that student uh, or two in the classroom who were. Uh, regurgitating racism um, in my classroom on these topics of systemic oppression, right? So that was one of the things. The other thing is that we were covering really heavy content. So um, I started the posted activity when, um, so Claudia Rankin um, in her book, 
there's a page where she lists people who have been killed by police. And depending on which edition you have, the list is longer. <laughs> so I have like the second printing of the book. So like there's only four people on the list. And then I students pointed this out to me. I didn't even know all of our books were different until we were in class, right? Um, and then there's other, like it's like up to three pages long. And so what I do is I take some of those names and I have them research in pairs or groups. But then once they find out like sort of all the different ways these people were killed, and this is so that they're prepared for when they read the book, this is kind of an introductory day, right? Um, it's a lot for them to process. And so one of the things that I really, um, I used to show like um, the end of the 13th and then ask students to like walk out. And now I don't even show the end of the 13th documentary because so many people die on camera. And I started like questioning, right? Like it's their choice if they want to watch that. I shouldn't be sharing it in the classroom. And so in the same way, when we're talking about that kind of heavy content, um, it just became a place for them to help process like what they were feeling and thinking. Um, and that's why I started doing the post suit activity. Thank you. We have a final question from David Chavez, Cynthia, and then we're going to transition after that question. Uh, so he said, great presentation, Cynthia. Could you speak more on the annotation assignment in class? Do you think it's important to scaffold up to our students at the beginning of the semester instead of just hit the ground running with 50 to 80 pages of reading for social science and humanity classes? Um, so I assign a lot of reading from the beginning. Um, and um, what I do is I'm mostly teaching them how to read the material at the beginning. So there's just more support, reading support in the terms of the way that the activities are and the assignments. So in the Google folder under uh, uh, classroom resources, you'll find um, a doc document that's called a uh, highlight a plus examples of highlight sheets i started doing this a couple uh years ago now and so instead of having them like annotate on paper um and this is also helps them if like um i'm sorry annotate books or print things or anything like that they just get a sheet of eight by eleven and they i don't like just have to fill that one sheet with things that were important to them um and so those are sort of ways that i'm doing the the helping support them from the beginning like anything they're writing down is important and they can basically do those however they want and i show the models um but really it's more about teaching them how to handle the difficult texts um i feel like uh, I've even brought in Cheryl Harris's Whiteness of Property, which is written in legalese and has way too many footnotes. Um, and I just like give them a well, four line paragraph and put them in a group of four and have them like uh, unpack that four lines that they have. Right. So it's more about helping them learn the skills to tackle something that is complicated versus shying away from it. I do often assign 20 to 60 pages of reading, but when I'm assigning that much, it's usually easier reading from, um, from like the book Border Patrol Nation, their chapters that are written in like nonfiction narratives. So they're, you know, they have a lot of information in them, but it's a little bit easier uh, to digest than say an academic article. When I assign an academic article, usually that's the only thing I'm assigning. That one academic article around 20 pages and nothing else for that week, right? Um, because it is going to be more difficult for them to digest and take their time with it. Thank you, Cynthia. Can we give affirmations to Cynthia in the chat box? Uh, you can unmute yourself and uh, clap it up. I learned so much and uh, looking forward to, to read your new book. Congratulations on the release of it. Thank you. Um, I did want to say just one last thing to leave you with is this as a, a gentle reminder, uh, remember that when you are walking into the classroom, you are walking in in the place of privilege. And that is so important for our students. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you. Okay. Um, we're, 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 uh, going strong, uh, and, and learning a lot from each other. And I'm really